When I met my wife, it was like everything in the world made sense at once. She was truly beautiful, long, wavy auburn hair cascaded down her shoulders, throwing out tones of bright ginger and blonde in the sunlight. Her eyes were a striking green and flicked upwards in the corner like a natural cat eye. Stunned didn't even begin to cover my feelings when I first saw her. I was a stuttering mess on our first date, but somehow this angelic woman wanted to see me again. Our relationship blossomed, but I, I never stopped worshipping her. I was in awe of everything about her, from that silky, gorgeous hair to her personality that I discovered perfectly complimented mine. We got married young, had two children together, a little girl named Freya and a son named Frankie. My family were my whole world. Everything I did was for them. I worked hard as an overnight taxi driver to provide for my wife and kids. I hated every minute of it. Nights came with lots of drunk and rude people, although we were allowed to charge more at the time. It didn't make up for all the extra stuff we had to put up with compared to the day drivers. It was awful, but worth it for the look on my kid's face every time they got a present or we took them away for a week. Around six months ago, my life changed forever due to an incident with a passenger in my taxi. She was young maybe 16 or 18, and looked like she had a lot of drugs. Her eyes were sunken back into her skull and sat above deep black bags. Her blonde, damaged hair was ratty and broken, leading from a set of greasy, dark roots. She bit her nails throughout the entire ride. Even for the brief moments that we spoke, they didn't leave her mouth. In my rearview mirror, I could see the faint outline of blood surrounding them as she gnawed at them. Being a driver that worked the graveyard shift, people in bad states were nothing new to me. Sadly, even young girls like this one were common. I knew the moment that she entered my car that she wasn't going to pay. Usually when I picked up a fare like this, I'll ask for the money up front. But I felt so sorry for this young girl that I didn't. I figured that if she ran out on me, maybe I'd at least have got her somewhere that she felt safe. She shook as if she was cold in the back the entire time, chewing on her nails like she was desperate to separate them from her fingers. When we reached our destination, we pulled up outside some awful-looking flats, cracked windows in the building, and broken bottles on the ground outside. There was a chain-fenced building site a few doors down the road that's fencing had been bent to allow people into the site. Squatters, I presumed. As I anticipated, the girl panicked when I asked her for the £6.90 fare. She looked at me in the rearview mirror with sheer terror in her eyes and started to unbutton her sheer blouse, revealing a painfully thin frame and a myriad of bruises all over her. I told her to stop, that I wasn't interested, asked her to give me her name and let me take her somewhere safer. She said no to all of it. Despite her protestations, she didn't get out of the car. I thought there might be some kind of hope for helping her out of her situation. Maybe she really did want help, but just didn't know how to ask. I was preparing myself to manually lock the doors and drive the girl to the police station when I saw a large, tall figure emerge from the flats that we were parked by. The man came charging up to the car just as the manual locks clicked and started to hammer on the windows, the girl in the back now hysterical, begging to be let out. My act of attempted chivalry had seriously backfired. The man's huge fist pounded on my passenger window so hard I was sure they would cave in. The girl had pried the lock open from the back and got out to hide behind this huge, intimidating figure, blouse still unbuttoned. As soon as she closed the door, I revved up the engine to drive away, locking the doors manually one more time. As I drove away, he shouted that I was a creep and a pervert. But catching last glimpses of the girl, I felt like my instincts to try and get her to safety had been right. As a taxi driver, I'm used to passengers running without payment or having altercations in the dead of night when I'd rather be at home cuddling my wife. This girl and her big boyfriend were nothing new, unfortunately. It was a sad incident on the reality that we lived in, but still, nothing new. What was new to me was the phone call I received the next day from the control room who allocated our jobs. They called to tell me about a complaint that had been made about me trying to kidnap and assault a young, vulnerable female. It had been called in by an incredibly rude, angry man threatening to take things further. The lady from control, Susan, was a good woman who I often bantered with in the office. She knew me well, even attended Freya's recent birthday party. So it was especially heartbreaking when she delivered the news that although the company would not be contacting the authorities, 
they would have no choice but to take me off the books with no reference for any future companies that I tried to sign up with. One passenger. Someone I was trying to help, and all of a sudden, I was jobless, unable to provide for my family. When I received the news, all I could think of was my beautiful wife. I couldn't bear to see the disappointment in her bright green eyes. The panic that we would no longer be able to give Frankie and Freya the lives we wanted them to have. I imagine having to explain why it had happened. So I didn't tell her. I knew it was wrong, but I just couldn't do it. I left in the car every night at 8 p.m., just like I always did. Drove aimlessly around our local town and the neighboring few, stopping at car parks, looking for work online and in papers. I figured if I could get a quick job, she would never even need to know. One night, around three weeks in unemployment, I sat in the car park of a local supermarket with a reading lamp and a newspaper, circling jobs that looked interesting. Wouldn't require a reference from my previous employer. Pickings were slim. I flipped a few pages, came across an incredibly disturbing article. Pictured was a young girl. The same young girl that I'd picked up in my taxi those weeks ago. But she looked healthier in the photo. Her cheeks were fuller, the black bags under her eyes were gone. She looked like a normal teenage girl. Next to the healthy looking photo was another photo of her back. Covered in huge purple welts and bruises. The article was describing her death. The hands of a drug dealer who had been suspected of trafficking girls. He had been caught driving under the influence of 1,000 pounds worth of narcotics in his car, and her, of course, beaten and bloodied in the boot. I recognized his photograph immediately as the large, intimidating man. I sobbed into my steering wheel. Why hadn't I done more? Why hadn't I called the police? Why didn't I just... I, I put up more of a fight with Susan. So many questions ran through my mind. I felt responsible for the death of this fragile little girl. I'm ashamed to say that I didn't handle the news in the best way. I didn't... It didn't inspire me to go home and tell my wife about my job or take responsibility and get a new job quicker to help my situation. It, instead, it drove me to the bottle. My downfall was ugly. I would spend hours in car parks getting utterly wasted in the dead of night. I'm humiliated by my actions. I drove drunk, didn't care about my own life, or consider the danger I presented to others. I went home with brutal hangovers, unable to spend any quality time with my family, and spent time drinking in the day when I thought no one could see. My addiction went hand in hand with a lack of sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, all I saw was that scared little girl chewing on her nails so hard they bled. My wife and I argued constantly, but I never opened up to her. Despite my abject stupidity, I was intelligent enough to understand the risks of drinking in my vehicle in, in public car parks in the open, even in the pitch black of night, so I found more secluded spots. Laybys and building sites became my friends until I eventually found the perfect place to hide from my responsibilities. It was a set of three parking spaces at the mouth of a large park that doubled as a, as a forest complete with camping site. In the daytime, it was... It was favored as a dog park and a space for creating family memories, and in the night, it was my haven from the shame and hurt that I was feeling. So I'm going to keep up my lies. The first night, I made it through an entire bottle of vodka just sitting in the driver's seat of my car, staring into the wooded area directly in front. It was completely still. Even the birds were sleeping. The quiet brought some comfort to the torture my mind had been going through. I soon started driving to that spot on a nightly basis. I would leave at 8 p.m. and hit a few of my usual supermarkets to buy supplies for the night before heading to the spot as it started to get dark. There was never another car in the parking lot. I saw the occasional group of teenagers trying to smoke weed in the dark, but other than that, I was always left alone. I frequented that spot for an entire month until I first saw it. And that month, my wife and I had begun to argue nonstop. My drinking had become a problem in the family home, and she couldn't understand why I was earning so little. I still couldn't find the courage to tell her that I was slowly squandering our life savings in my addiction and lies. We argued bad before I left that night. 
I put it down to a lack of sleep and booze that first time when she appeared. Standing there covered in bruises, she wore that same sheer blouse that she had when I picked her up. Unbuttoned still, with tiny denim shorts showing off her long, thin, purple legs. She stood there, amongst the trees, just staring at my car, not really moving other than to furiously bite at what little fingernail appeared to be left on her bloody digits. Her sunken, blackened eyes were back, growing deep in my soul with every second that we kept eye contact. Couldn't bear to look. But it was also impossible to look away. I must have sat there for at least an hour, swaying. Everything moved and spun a little in that boozy vision that was becoming my norm. Everything, that is, except her. She stayed entirely steady, just staring at me. The world tilting around her as she remained still, aside from the incessant chewing. I didn't sleep that night at all. Maybe that contributed to me returning the next night. I suppose people make poor decisions when they don't sleep. Maybe my mind was just too shot to pieces from the booze anyway, otherwise I returned. By the way, she was there again. She looked slightly more battered than she had the night before. Bruises had turned deeper shades of purple, and her eyes seemed to have sunk further than possible for a living human being. The flesh covering her bony frame was papery and transparent in the areas that weren't beaten. She had moved slightly closer to the car, just a few steps, but enough that even in my drunken state I had noticed, and it unnerved me. I drove away early that night, and came home early, telling my wife as she stirred when I came in that it had been a slow night and I decided to come home. I suspected she smelled the alcohol in my breath, but she didn't say a word, just made a soft noise of acknowledgement. I found some comfort in listening to her breathe that night, watching the rhythmic rise and fall of her chest, offering a distraction to the images of that young, dead girl that plagued my mind. I laid in bed watching. It took until morning for me to notice that I had bitten my nails until they bled, leaving exposed nail beds on several. The following night, I drove out like I always do. I avoided my spot. I couldn't face seeing her anymore. It wasn't healthy for me. My mind was playing all sorts of tricks on me, and my heavy drinking was contributing to serious issues in my mind. My nails were excruciatingly sore as they pressed against my steering wheel. I burned through so much gas that night just driving around, but I didn't see her not standing in front of me anyway. Nothing, nothing could remove her image from my mind. Her eyes begged for help. For a few nights, I realized that I couldn't sustain the petrol that I'd been burning without picking up fares. I needed somewhere to stop if I was going to keep up my lies. I racked my brains. I were frazzled for a few weeks from sleep deprivation and whiskey. I drove back there. I, I could see the error of my decisions now. At the time, I was blinded by the alcohol. I was drowning in it. Something kept drawing me back there. I wish it hadn't, but it did. She was there, waiting for me. And this time, she had become a literal corpse. There were no visible signs of breathing or life left in her. The tattered, sheer blouse still hung unbuttoned, revealing ribs that resembled a child's drawing of ocean waves. The blue and greens that would make up an ocean in the picture just added to layers of bruises in a ghastly scene. She came closer than ever before. Her bloody, stubby fingers tapped on my car bonnet, sending shivers through my whole body with every tap. I closed my eyes, scrunching up my face and willing her to go away, and when I opened my eyes, she had. My joy was short-lived. She had disappeared from in front of my car, but as my eyes strayed towards the rearview mirror, I saw her sunken eyes, staring back at me from the same seat she had sat in the first time I picked her up when she was alive. I screamed, and I scrambled out of the car, emptying my stomach content on the hard, leafy ground as I exited the vehicle, my hands resting on my knees as I bent over, trying to stop myself from throwing up again. It took a while to stand up and steady myself, but when I did, she was gone again. She wasn't in front of my car or inside of it. I was about to go back in and drive home. I was going to confess everything to my wife, ask for help. I was losing my mind and I needed to do something about it. I couldn't go on like this. And then I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. Something hanging. Trapped between the closed gap and the boot. I moved closer to the back of the car. 
the sickness creeping back up in my stomach as I approached my closed boot. I didn't, it didn't take long until I knew exactly what it was. There was no mistaking that ratty, dyed blonde strand of hair, broken and damaged with a dark, greasy root at the very top. I didn't need to spring open the trunk to know what was inside. She was there, dead, just like she had been in that big man's car. Woozy and far too intoxicated to drive, I got back behind the wheel and I started the engine. My drive home felt like a uh, personification off autopilot. I didn't remember any of my turnings or any hazards I may have ob uh, observed on the road. All I could think of the entire drive home was that strand of ratty blonde hair. The crumpled up body I was certain was behind in the trunk. My awareness of my paranoia was starting to subside. I was so sleep deprived, life felt like a waking nightmare. My earlier plans to come clean and get help were dead in the water. I just wanted this girl to stop following me. My eyes felt wide and strained as I got out of the car. My mind was working at a hundred miles a minute, and I don't think I'd been capable of sleep no matter what. I walked around the back of the car to get to my front door, and as I passed the boot, the strand of blonde hair was gone. The damage was done. I had bitten off almost all the nails on my right index finger throughout this ordeal. Blood streamed down my hand. I stood in the harsh light of the bathroom, trying to wash it clean before getting into bed next to my wife. She felt like a stranger at this point. My life had become so consumed by my drinking and this goddamn girl that I had disconnected from my family. My kids were growing up without me present, and my wife was raising them alone. <laughs> I figured she probably knew about my lies by now, but she still hadn't tried to confront me, so I didn't intend to discuss it with her. No one would employ me in my current state anyway. I laid in bed twitching. The girl never once left my mind. Her hollow sunken sockets for eyes got worse the more I imagined her, and her entire body was almost blanketed by bruises now. She had been tattooed completely purple. I looked at the clock at various intervals, desperate to fall asleep and get some relief from this eternal nightmare. 55, 5.32, 6.47, Something was wrong with that last one. It wasn't my bedroom clock. It wasn't the digital display I'd been looking at all night. It was the digital clock on the radio in my car. The bird's song and the sun blinded me through the windows. It wasn't anything like the sort of thing that I was used to driving the graveyard shift. These trees in front of me looked tall, proud, beautiful. I didn't know how I had made it back to my spot, even with all my current issues. I had never been one to black out like this when drunk. I was terrified. I got out of the car, looking at the floor, relieved to get out of that eyeline of the sun. Although this did little to calm my nerves. My hands were red with blood from the mangled nails I appeared to have ripped off at my teeth. As I looked up towards the trees opposite my car, I saw her, staring back at me, for the very first time with a smile on her face, albeit a sinister one. I staggered backwards, trying to avoid getting any closer to her. I could feel eyes staring at me, dog walkers entering and exiting the park, ready to start their morning routine. I wasn't prepared for the outside world during these active hours. I'm sure my dripping, blood-covered hands drew plenty of attention. I stood unsteady on my feet, staring back at her twisted, smiling face until I heard sirens in the distance. I didn't really register them until they were piercing my eardrums. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. As the police dragged me to their car, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. Something... Trapped. Trapped in the closed trunk. This time it wasn't blonde. I could still see that strand of long auburn hair, silky, wavy, nothing like the ratty blonde strand that I had seen before. As the police car drove me away, uh, I deserved the sentence I got. I killed my wife, our two children, massacred my entire family, and still have no recollection. My defense tried to attribute it to sleep deprivation, alcohol, induced temporary psychosis, but I knew that was... I knew it was her. When I first arrived in prison, I tried to kill myself multiple times. They had me on they had me on watch for a while, but my attempts were futile. They'd always find me just in time. I gave up trying, and I'm prepared to live out my punishment. I don't deserve the release of dying. I should suffer. I still see her every night, staring at me through the cell door, sunken eyes, black, terrifying. I wish nightly that my wife would visit me instead just once. 
I was starting to come around to what the doctors were telling me, that she wasn't real. She's just a symptom. I was really starting to make steps, but then they moved us around. Everyone got new cellmates. I wasn't happy with mine at first. I was truly terrified, but when I discovered that he can see her too, I warmed up to him. But he was the one that told me writing everything down might be a good thing. His dreams have been plagued just like mine. He lent the phone I'm posting on to apologize for getting me fired. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching today's video. And if you're on the podcast, then thank you for watching today's podcast. And if you're on uh, not the video or the podcast, then thank you for tuning into this telepathic broadcast. Oh, and there's something I need to mention to all of you. It's actually the big Halloween surprise. I mentioned this early on in the summer, but I never really got a chance to say what it was, because it wasn't really nailed down at the time. We, and by we, I mean me, Creeps McPasta, and Mew are going on tour across the United States in October. All the dates for it have been nailed down as of actually today, and tickets should be going on sale as of actually today. If you'd like to find out more, I'm going to have a bunch of information in the description down below all the way up until the tour is finished. But if you want to get a hold of your tickets, all the venues we've chosen have very limited seating, so make sure you get your tickets now if we're heading to a town near you. And one of the most exciting things about this is that I've been able to work with Mew across the United States doing conventions over the past couple of years. But this is the first time I think that Creeps McPasta is coming to the U.S. And it's especially the first time I'm going to be able to work with him live on stage. So this is going to be a show that's bigger than anything I've ever dreamed of being able to do in my entire YouTube career. So check it out down below at MarginWalkerPresents.com to get a hold of your tickets and come see us to celebrate Spooktober. Especially, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys over at Patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta are the best. Especially, Trace Miles, Talon Karlick, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Dr. Strawberry, Daniel Polson, Champinsky, Ken Lando Higuchi, Rev Miroku, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Said El Yassin, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Goonington, G. Weevil 3, Chance Burnett, Diana Krauss, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Titty Connoisseur, Melissa Swaygart, Kudir Max, Jay Kerbine, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, Chris Wrights, The Ginger Bros, Mads Beck Lorenzen Post, Don Mulmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Andrew Stenberg, Jason Silsma, Steampunk Center, and Rafael Rodriguez. If you guys would like to join them, you can head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And that's it for tonight. Sweet dreams, everyone.